Welcome to Change It Up Radio, here with Paula Shaw. It's so good to see you all again. I am really, well, see and uh, be heard (laughs) by so many of you. We do also video this show, so I feel like I'm seeing you, and I know that many of you are seeing me. I'm your host here on Change It Up Radio, and most of you also know that I am also a life transition coach. I work with people who are dealing with change, the upheaval of change, the difficulty of change, because we all know that change can be a real challenge for so many of us. It's, as we always say, We need the variety that change brings us, but we hate the the discomfort of the unfamiliar. And we also often have trouble adjusting to the unfamiliar. So change can be a mixed blessing. And in my work, I help guide people through their experience with change to make it more successful and productive. And I love doing that. It's part of what we do here on this show. We are either spotlighting change makers who are trying to make the world a better place, or we are bringing you information to help you deal better and more productively with change. And that's what my guest, Dr. Chloe Carmichael, is going to be sharing with us today. And I'm so excited for you to meet her because she has written a book that I think we all need to get (laughs) that's called Nervous Energy, Harness the Power of Your, oh shoot, I forgot the last word, but I'll be finding it in just a moment. Nervous Energy, Harness the Power of, wait a second. Darn, it wasn't on my top sheet here, but I do have it Harness in the, the notes. Harness the power of your anxiety. Bless you, Dr. Chloe. <laughs> Harness the power of your anxiety. I wanted to get that part right because I know it feel that's going to feel kind of shocking to a lot of you. Harnessing the power of your anxiety. So she will be joining us very shortly. And thankfully, she's also the little angel in my ear (laughs) and heard me stumbling around looking for that last word. Anyway, also please remember that if you want to learn more about my work as a speaker, uh, the author of Grief, When Will This Pain Ever End? And saying the right thing when you don't know what to say. A very handy book that so many of us need. I wrote that book because after writing the grief book and after over 28 years of working with grieving people who are dealing with huge upheaval and change, I realized that so often people are feeling abandoned They're feeling uncared for because people don't come by to see them. They don't call. They aren't stepping up and trying to support these people, oftentimes going through huge losses. And I realized that the reason people aren't doing that is not because they don't care, but it's because they don't feel competent to say and do the right things that are going to be helpful for the grieving person or the person dealing with some other kind of loss. And so they avoid showing up. They avoid having that interaction and that can often be very problematic. So saying the right thing when you don't know what to say is a brief little book that literally goes into the why we don't show up, and then gives you actual specific sentences that are helpful and those that are not helpful when you are trying to comfort or support someone in pain. And if you'd like to get a kind of a cheat sheet on exactly what this book talks about, you can go to my website, paulashaw.com, and get a free gift of an ebook called 20 things to say and not to say to people in emotional pain 
and that will give you some great ideas of the kinds of things that are helpful and the kinds of things that are not. Okay, and also if you want to learn more about Change It Up Radio, please go to changeituprradio.com. And this is actually our first show, just as a podcast. I have been doing radio in San Diego for nearly five years and decided that I wanted to just step full time into the podcast world so that I could focus on growing a worldwide audience and, and exposing these amazing people that come on my show to more of you all over the world. So as always, we are on every major podcast platform and the new platform that I'm so excited about, Podopolo, which is going to change the whole podcast world. It's going to be launching very soon. It's an app and it's a platform and we'll be able to interact with each other on Podopolo. You'll be able to ask questions. I will really get the opportunity to meet my listeners and get to interact with them. And that I am very excited about. And Dr. Chloe and I have already talked about future shows we might do with great topics on helping young kids, I mean, teenage type kids with anxiety, performers with anxiety. You know, I mean, there's so many areas of our lives where we run into reasons to worry or to be anxious. So we've got lots of cool things coming up. But today I'm excited about talking about this because it's a big problem. And it's a big problem all over the world. I mean, let's face it, we're, we've all just lived through the weirdest year ever with this pandemic that we've had to deal with. And, and so on top of the normal everyday anxiety and all the things people can get worried about, we've had a virus to worry about. We've had interactions with others to worry about. We've had so many things that we'll be exploring more with Dr. Chloe. But here's a few statistics just to give you an idea of how big this problem is. 40 million adults are affected by anxiety disorder. One out of 20 children were found to have anxiety or depression in a single year. Children. Only 36.9% of those with anxiety disorder are receiving any kind of treatment. And one in three high school children are experiencing anxiety disorder. And I know in my own practice, I'm dealing with that right now, especially because many of these kids have spent nearly a year in their bedrooms on a computer. And now it's time to go back to campus. And I'm really looking forward to getting into that discussion with Dr. Chloe. So I think perhaps, oh, a couple of things I also want to say about that before we talk with Dr. Chloe. Why? What's, what is causing so much anxiety? What are some of the factors, especially with teenagers? And I think this is true for all of us. High expectations and pressure to succeed. Whether we're imposing that on ourselves or whether your parents are imposing that on you as a teenager, that's a tough one. The state of the world right now for so many reasons, the racial unrest, the pandemic, the, you know, all of the realities going on politically in countries all over the world. It's a scary world. So that's adding to our problems. And social media. I don't know about the rest of you. I'm a boomer and there was no social media when I was a kid. And yet there was enough pressure comparing yourself just to the kids in your school. But now to compare yourself to kids all over the world and not know how you stand or worry about how you stand in that arena, that's really tough on kids. It's very tough on kids. So we've got some issues that are, that are really pressing out there that are making life difficult and scary 
for all of us. So some of the signs, if you're a parent, some of the signs you might want to look for in your child if, to determine whether or not they may be experiencing anxiety disorder, recurring fears and worries about routine kind of everyday things, changes in their behavior, maybe irritability or suddenly going very inward, avoiding activities, in school, avoiding school or social interactions, trouble sleeping or concentrating, substance use, and chronic physical complaints like fatigue, um, uh, headaches, stomach aches, that kind of a thing. And we're going to be talking to Dr. Chloe in just a minute about what are some great solutions for that. What can we do? But as a parent, I can tell you I'm a parent too and my daughter dealt with anxiety and one of the first things you want to do is talk to them. Be open. Don't judge. Be open. Be comforting. Be supportive and let them tell you about what they're experiencing and what they're feeling. Try to pull back on those expectations. Don't set overly high expectations because that may be causing more and more anxiety for your child. And be aware of what they're doing and what's going on with social media. So those are a few ideas for you. And now I want to introduce you to Dr. Chloe Carmichael. She is a clinical psychologist and the author of, we're going to get it straight this time, Nervous Energy, Harness the Power of Your Anxiety. She says that while the pandemic's been a source of stress for everyone, if you're a goal-oriented person with a to-do list and you're an overachiever, you may be experiencing even more anxiety than usual. She has a successful practice in New York City that focuses on relationship issues and stress, helping high achievers. She's on the advisory board for Women's Health Magazine and writes an expert blog for Psychology Today. She continues to be a thought leader in anxiety treatment and has launched an online anxiety treatment program called anxietytools.com, which has users from all over the world. Dr. Chloe, welcome. I'm so delighted to see you and be with you. Paula, the feeling is mutual. I love your work and it is such a pleasure to be here with you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So it's been a stressful time for the whole world, really, for the last year. So let's talk a little bit about that. What are some of the things you see that seem to be upping the anxiety level for people in general? Well, as you said, Paula, I think that many people who are not used to feeling overwhelmed mm -hmm. have been a little overwhelmed in the past year, right? It's been one for the books, so to speak, Amen. in terms of you know, <laughs> pandemic and everything else, right? Yes. So I think that for some people who aren't used to feeling overwhelmed mm -hmm. and maybe who are used to doing healthy things like relying on their social support networks and those mm -hmm. types of things that have been challenged because of the pandemic, they've had almost anxiety about anxiety where they start saying, oh, gee, I notice I'm feeling stressed. And then they start getting stressed about that, which is part of the reason why I felt that nervous energy harness the power of your anxiety was a helpful message to let people know that anxiety is not always inappropriate. In fact, it has a very healthy function, which is to stimulate preparation behaviors. So that was the message behind it for me. I love that. Talk a little bit more about preparation behaviors. What exactly is that? Sure. So I've noticed that a lot of people, you know, when they're feeling anxiety, they'll say things like, oh, well, I, when I feel anxiety, I just take a deep breath and let go. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's helpful. Like if you know that you're getting worked up over nothing, mm -hmm. but a lot of times if we're getting worked up, maybe because we're concerned about feeling that lack of social support, or we're concerned about many other things that have been on people's mind 
letting go isn't always the best thing. A lot of times what actually alleviates anxiety is taking a good, healthy self-care behavior or proactive step in preparing. So for example, Mm -hmm. a while ago, several years ago, when the United States was more vulnerable and experiencing more terrorist attacks, Mm -hmm. people were having anxiety and some of the healthy preparations in New York City that they were telling us where I was living at the time, you know, were like to get your go bag together and things like that. And so I'd be talking to a lot of people that were seeing that they had anxiety, but they hadn't put together their go bag, right? And so when we don't listen to the anxiety and that stimulation, or it could be, you know, you're anxious about a big test that you have coming up, Mm -hmm. instead of sitting there and ruminating about it, my book teaches people how to point that anxiety into a constructive purpose which is the way that mother nature intended it. It gives us a little boost of adrenaline, which can either be used for energy to do something or to ruminate, which is what we don't want to do. Oh, I just love that. And you know what? I think we will stop right there for a moment, take a quick break, and then let's come back and talk about that. Because I think the whole concept of ruminating and worry is a very interesting one. So stay with us. We will be right back with Dr. Chloe Carmichael. Welcome back to Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw. My guest today is Dr. Chloe Carmichael, who is a specialist in dealing with anxiety. So listen up, everybody, because we all deal with anxiety at one time or another. She's also the author of Nervous Energy, Harness the Power of Your Anxiety, which I just love that title because as I mentioned in the first segment, so many of us think of anxiety as just this negative thing. And um, Dr. Chloe is going to teach us how to use it to actually handle the normal and the unnormal, the abnormal stress in our lives better. So Dr. Chloe, you were just talking a bit about ruminating and I was really fascinated recently to read that the human brain is actually programmed for worry and negative thinking because that was how we survived in primitive times, right? To know the things to watch out for. So in a way, positivity, which everybody's talking about today, is going against our natural wiring, isn't it? Well, it, it is and it isn't. The, the whole thing is about balance. And that's a really interesting point, Paula. It, it's true that in our caveman days, if we didn't have the ability to think and worry a little bit about the future, right, we mm-hmm. wouldn't have say, you know, prepared for a famine right. during times of bounty. The modern day equivalent is that a person without anxiety would never look both ways before they cross the street, right? (laughs) So there's definitely actually a very healthy function of anxiety. We just want to make sure that we don't lose the plot, so to speak. A lot of people, when they feel anxiety, they'll actually become self-critical, which breaks my heart because Again, they're actually, they're, they're coming from a good place. There is a very healthy function of anxiety. So just to use that example from before the break, if you're nervous about a big test, don't just try to yell at yourself, you know, and be mad (laughs) at yourself for being nervous. Mm -hmm. And it's also not necessarily the right move to just be positive and say, well, I'm sure I'll know all the answers, right? Sometimes the healthy move is to say, wow. I'm having a healthy awareness that I'm not fully prepared for that test. And maybe this restless energy could be put to good use of, say, making flashcards, for example, right? Uh So my book is really just about, it's actually nine practical techniques to help people connect the dots between their body and mind of that anxious energy and what they can be doing to actually be more productive and less stressed. Because when we point that energy towards good self-care around whatever's making us anxious, we actually end up better off. 
So I'm dying to ask you now, <laughs> what are some of the other tips that you have for taking that energy and using it in a positive way or a productive way? Sure. Well, uh, just to use a very timely example, I know many people have had kind of a cognitive habit of ruminating or worrying about the pandemic and COVID and everything else, right? right. And now, thank goodness, we have three vaccines, things are starting to, you know, it's, it's time for a new day. Yes. But many, many people are kind of stuck in a cognitive rut. And it's actually an interesting feature of intelligent driven people that once we get something in our minds, we can almost be like a dog with a bone. We can have a very tenacious mind, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not a bad thing. And it's a high functioning mind that tends to take shortcuts and get habits. So if many people just have a habit of, you know, defaulting to stress about the pandemic and they need to change it, a good tool from my book, for example, would be a tool called the mental shortlist, getting a new mental shortlist. Ah. And so what we do there is we come up with five good topics that we know would be so much better to think about. It could be anything from, you know, some birthday and holiday shopping to get a jump on mm -hmm. to maybe mentally practicing a meditation routine that you've been meaning to do um you know calling a friend that always slips to your mind mm -hmm. a particular work project you know really anything but the idea is that you in advance think about five things that you know would be much better for your new mental shortlist yes. and then when your mind starts <clears throat> defaulting and to worry about the pandemic, which is kind of an outmoded, outdated topic at this point, that's probably not doing you any good anymore to mm -hmm. keep thinking about, even though at one point it did, which right. is again, understandable. There was a time when we developed that habit for a reason. Now we need to give our minds the tools to easily pivot onto a new mental shortlist. So that would be one example from the book to answer your question, Paula. That's really great. You know, one of the things I've told clients over the years is sort of similar, but it's sort of like have it. Well, back in my day, we had something called a Rolodex, <laughs> which was like a little rolling thing of cards. A lot of people don't even know about it now, young people. But I would always say the same kind of thing. Have a few pictures in your mind that always make you smile, like puppies, babies, some fabulous moment in your life, you know, sometimes those can really support people as well. But what I love about your short list is it's giving them an action. And when we're in action, that can really help us to avoid that ruminating stuck place. Well, that's very true, Paula. So I would, I would also add, you know, to, to your point about, you know, thinking about positive things, which mm -hmm. is obviously very helpful. Um, the, ang the anxious part of us is oftentimes, you know, feeling fulfilled when it feels like it's solving a problem. Ah. And so it mm -hmm. used to get fulfillment out of solving the problem of figuring out how to be safe during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But now it's kind of chasing its tail around that one. Oh. So we want to give it a few other good, healthy problems that we actually need solved now so yes. that that part of ourselves can become productive again. Oh, I love that. So that's why the shopping list maybe, or for the holidays coming up or something exactly. else. Ah, I It's love about self-care. Yeah. That's very good. And I think that makes such sense to put us in action rather than, because sometimes it's like a, one of my favorite teachers says, it doesn't help to put a happy face on an empty gas tank. So sometimes trying to visualize something happy, I think would not be as powerful as what you're suggesting to actually go into a new problem, but not one that creates all that anxiety for you, but one that might actually create joy. Right. In fact, also, it, it's it, in addition to being one that, you know, doesn't create anxiety, if the issue still is creating legitimate anxiety, mm -hmm. then we do want to focus on it. But yes. the mental shortlist is good for problems that are actually just residual problems. Like, for example, if you've broke up with somebody, you know, you have an ex, you've already 
talked to death about everything about it. <laughs> you know, there's no point in reaching out. You know, you've done all your, your work on it, but you just have this habit of just thinking about the person. Yes. This one, it's an old habit and you just want to give yourself a new set of cognitive habits and the mental shortlist is good, but the mental shortlist is only good if you've truly done all the work you need to do mm. on whatever it is that you're pivoting away from. If yes. there's more work to do, then the mental shortlist is just escapism. You need to make sure that you've really done the work and then you have Dr. Chloe's permission to use the mental shortlist. I love that. I love that. And it reminds me of when I, I used to run a grief group and so often people try to jump to forgiveness before they've really given their inner child, given themselves their day in the sun, so to speak, you know, uh -huh. really worked through the things that were hurtful for them. So I get what you're saying totally, and that makes such good sense. So let me ask you, Dr. Chloe, why do you think so many teenagers are really suffering anxiety disorder over the idea of returning to school? I mean, you would think on the one hand, that looks like fun. It would be great to get out of the bedroom and back on campus. And yet so many of them are not feeling that way. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's a really good question, Paula. I think that part of it is just because they haven't been in a group setting. It's not just teenagers. A lot of adults as well are very yes. nervous just about, you know, even just returning to a a, a group work setting. Mm -hmm. And so this, um, I, I really love acronyms, right? And so I also love solutions. And one of the little tips that I have currently for people who are dealing with that problem is an acronym called SUN, S-U-N, with the idea of being that sunlight is the best disinfectant. Love and it. so the S is for scan. So when we go into a group setting, whether it be a classroom or a boardroom, I want you to scan for five signs of social acceptance. That could be eye contact, that could be a smile, it could be open body language, it could be a hello. It doesn't have to be any big thing. In fact, you know, usually when you walk into a room, people are, you know, not jumping up and down. They're just having a normal, <laughs> subtle greeting. But mm -hmm. by training yourself to just start scanning for five signs of social acceptance, that will stop that internal anxious monologue. And the U is for update because in psychology, we have something called the halo effect where when we first meet someone, if they make a positive impression, we filter everything through that negative impression. We filter everything through that. Mm -hmm. Naturally, we all got a negative impression of COVID when we first <laughs> met it. And right. we thought there were shortages in the grocery stores, shortages of ventilators, mm -hmm. everything else. Some of us are still mentally and emotionally responding to the pandemic as if we're in that stage. So we need to consciously update our minds that we uh. now have three vaccines and everything else. The N is to normalize that a little anxiety is understandable. It just, it's when you're doing something you haven't done in a while, it can even actually signify investment and excitement in what's going on around you. So whether it be a teenager or an adult, I would invite them to think about the SUN, S-U-N acronym for scan, update, and normalize. Oh, I love that. And that's such a great little tool. You know, I love things like acronyms too, because I'm very big on putting tools in people's hands, because as you know, there's a lot of life that goes on in between sessions with us and people need those tools to, to help them like a little bit of armor, you know, before they go out into the world. So that's Definitely. a beauty. And if any of your listeners, you know, would like, a, I actually have a video, I do a series called the Mental Health Minute. So mm -hmm. if anybody wants to like DM me or drop anything in the comment section of, of Paula's live stream, I would be glad to just share a video of me going through the sun system in more detail. Oh, that's so wonderful. And while we're at it, Dr. Chloe, why don't you give our listeners your website and, you know, all that critical information, because I'm sure people will want to learn more from you. Sure. Thank you. So the easiest thing is the nervous 
energy book website. So nervousenergybook.com is about my book, Nervous Energy, Harness the Power of Your Anxiety, but that was too long. So just <laughs> nervousenergybook.com mm-hmm. or you can go to drchloe.com slash hello. That's drchloe.com slash hello. And it will have links to all of my socials. I you know, do a lot of YouTube videos and everything else. Fabulous, fabulous. That's really great. You know, one of the things I was really looking forward to asking you because I noticed in your in your bio that you are also a meditator, that you've even been a yoga instructor. And so, you know, I come from the world of energy psychology. And so we're always working with the energy as well as, you know, the behavior and, and the more obvious issues. And one of the things I'm very aware of is that whatever we focus on, we feed energy to. And whatever we feed energy to is going to grow. So how would you use this concept in helping people with anxiety? Mm, Wow, that is a great question. So uh, the reason, so there are nine techniques in the book. Mm -hmm. And the first one is a mindfulness technique. So the book says that the rest of the eight techniques in the book are kind of optional. It's like a cookbook. You don't have to do them in order, whatever works for you. Mm -hmm. But I do suggest that people start with the first technique first, because to your point, Paula, what we focus on, you know, is what grows. And so that mindful ability to just listen to the anxiety, to watch it and not become alarmed by it, Mm -hmm. but in fact, learn to dialogue with it. Learn to, you know, ask it like anxiety. I'm going to stop shouting you down. In fact, I'm going to thank you because you're probably just trying to, you know, flag my attention to something that might be helpful. Mm -hmm. And maybe we've been going about it the wrong way. Like maybe, you know, berating myself or having panic attacks, maybe that's not so helpful, but I'm, I'm not going to stop listening and understanding, you know, what your message is anxiety. What is it that I need to focus on and listening to it quickly will actually inform you as to what of the other eight techniques or maybe other techniques in your own self-care repertoire might be best for you. That's so cool. And you mentioned a word that I think is a big trigger for so many people. Either they fear it happening or it has happened and now they fear it. Panic attacks. Where do they come from and what on earth can we do about them? Such an interesting question, Paula. So as a clinical psychologist and a former yoga teacher, I've really like looked at panic attacks from a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And I will share also this experience that I'm sharing is is limited to my experience in private practice working with, you know, what's known as high functioning people, Paula, which I'm guessing is you and probably most of your listeners. Um, So it's it's people that are basically able to manage their lives, Uh but then yet they find themselves having panic attacks that seem to come out of the blue for reasons that they don't fully understand. And when I talk to people in my office that are having panic attacks, A lot of times they'll say, you know, I don't know what they're about. It just feels like everything is fine. And then out of the blue, out of the blue, I have this panic attack. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I find that what they need to learn to do is listen to and articulate their anxiety at lower levels. They've actually gotten so good at putting their emotions aside, which is a great skill. Some people Mm -hmm. need to learn how to do that. But people in my personal experience with panic attacks are often people that have gotten too good at that. So they'll be dealing with really weird anxiety provoking situations like a boss that's always making snide remarks or, you know, a partner who doesn't show up and who's unreliable, Mm -hmm. but they're going through those daily experiences and just saying, it's okay. I can handle it. Uh, and it's pushing true. It down, huh? yeah, pushing they, it down. they can handle it. Mm-hmm. But the question is just because you can handle it doesn't mean you should handle it. Right. Yes. And so when yes. they give themselves permission to start connecting with what's bothering them, when it's at lower levels, a lot of times the panic attacks will subside. That's 
had, I personally had a panic attack on national television and oh I did God. use an anxiety technique from my book to help me with it. I was being interviewed on the Nancy Grace show. I had too much coffee. I was uh -huh. talking about a gruesome murder as often happens on the Nancy Grace show. And I'm sure that just kind of contributed to it. Mm -hmm. And I mispronounced a word and started to freak out. And next <laughs> thing I knew I was having this panic attack oh, and like, kind of like, but what I did is I did this technique from the book. Um, and it's actually that first technique. It's a mindfulness technique that's blended with a breathing technique. And I, you know, trains you to get that oxygen into your body yes. and clear your mind and reconnect with yourself. And if you watch the clip, which um, I may share one day, you can actually mm -hmm. see where it's like, you can see me squirming. And then all of a sudden I go, and then I just come back to life. So, wow. you know, there, I think breathing is a big one. Also in the book, I talk about anchoring statements because in panic attacks, we often actually lose our ability to think in language. And that in mm -hmm. itself is very unnerving for people, especially oh, yes. high functioning, intelligent people. Mm -hmm. So anchoring statements are, is another technique in the book for people who know they tend to get into that panic attack space and it guides them to come up with some really specific pre-crafted statements that are so simple that they would bore you to tears in your normal life. <laughs> but during a panic attack moment, there are just the nice, simple, straightforward statements you need to mm -hmm. re, re, um, restart the language part of your brain. You know, one of the things that occurs to me is that one of the reasons anxiety is such a problem for people is because they fear it. They feel helpless with it. And I think, Dr. Chloe, what you've done with the, the nine steps, the nine tips that you give in your book is you've found a way to help people get more friendly with their anxiety and drop the fear, which I'm sure in itself is helpful because whatever we fear is usually something we don't understand, we don't know, and knowledge overcomes fear. Tools overcome fear because we feel a little bit more capable, you know, we're empowered. And so I love what you've done and I can't, say enough times i think all of us need a copy of nervous energy and so if you would one more time you definitely have to come back because this time flew by way too quickly but would you give our listeners your contact info absolutely the easiest thing to do is if you just want the book i was quite insistent with the publisher that it had to also be an audiobook because i think a lot of times people just need to hear someone talking them through so you can go to amazon yes. and get it on you know paper kindle or audible mm -hmm. or if you go to nervousenergybook.com there's a video of me doing that breathing technique i mentioned oh, and great. all my social handles are linked through there so either amazon for nervous energy harness the power of your anxiety or nervousenergybook.com beautiful Dr. Chloe, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been wonderful information, really, really valuable information. And I definitely will be arranging with you to come back because I think we can do a whole show on the anxiety that teenagers are going through, for example, or like we talked about performers, or all of us have to perform on some level in our lives, don't we? You know, whether it's in your job, or you know, if your profession requires you to speak or sing or draw or whatever else you do, there's so many things we can talk about. So I look forward to you coming back on the show again. And thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all you contributed today. Pleasure is mine, Paula. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you. And thank you to my listeners for being with us today. Remember, you can find Change It Up Radio, the podcast, on every major podcast platform. We have an Instagram page, we have a Facebook page, and we have a YouTube channel. So please find us, subscribe. We love reviews and tell your friends about our show. Alrighty, thanks for joining us. See you again next week. Bye-bye.